مزاری قیس پہ جب روح لیلا ایک دن آئی تو ارمانوں کے مرجھائے ہوئے کچھ پھول بھی لائی لگی جب پھول رکھنے لگی جب پھول رکھنے تو قبر سے آواز یہ آئی So today, there's lots of, lots of things that I could call this. I call it a love story in stone. I'm going to try not to, to confuse you. Hang on a second. Um, um, can everybody mute? That'll make life a little bit easier. Um, Um, so love story in stone. I'm going to try not to confuse you with names. Don't get bogged down in them. It's been called a teardrop on the face of time. That was from a poet. Eleanor Roosevelt said, this is a beauty that enters the soul. And Rudyard Kipling said, it's the embodiment of all things pure, all things holy and all things unhappy. Interesting. It is perhaps the most recognizable symbol of India. Last week I mentioned the term place. If you saw a picture of this in a beginning of a movie, you go, oh, I'm, at, I'm in India. This movie takes place in India. Um, the Taj Mahal is a love story, but it's also a, a symbol of power in a period of Indian history, which is a high point, a real high point, but it's also the beginning of the end. Everything's going to begin to crash down. Um, it's the jewel in the crown, and yet it's the poison that's, that kills something. Um, first, a few things about India. India is a slightly larger than one third the size of the United States. And um, its population is 1.4 billion people. It is very close to China, in fact, maybe larger than China in terms of population. But China is about the same size as the United States. So think about this, this country is a third of the size but it has four times our population. So consider the difficulties that you would have in running a country with everybody that crowded. It is a very complicated country. And almost any statement that someone makes about the country can be proven wrong um, by something else. It's very diverse in terms of everything. Um, in terms of geography, <clears throat> it has everything from deserts to rainforest, coastal plains areas which are barely above sea level to the Himalayas. Um, there are places that average less than 25 inches of rain a year, some very, the Thar Desert, basically no rain every year. But there's other places that there's more than 100 inches of rain a year. We have 40, um, 40 to 45 average in this area. Um, so, you know, think about twice as much uh, rainfall. And the rainfall is not evenly distributed. Some places that have 100 inches of rain a year, that might come in one three month period. And then you may have months with no rain whatsoever. There are 22 officially recognized languages in India, okay? 22 officially recognized. Now, in our country, English is the only officially recognized language. In um, <clears throat> Canada, we've got um, two, uh, maybe three officially recognized languages, French, English, 
<clears throat> and I think if I remember correctly, the Inuit is, has been recognized as well. But there's at least 780 different languages spoken in the country. Imagine trying to rule a country where 780 languages are spoken <clears throat> other than English. Sorry about that. Let me get it. Other than English, which is, of course, a foreign language. <clears throat> the language spoken most frequently is Hindi. And it's the native language for 41% of the country. And if we add in the people who learn it as a second language, like we might learn Spanish here in this country, 54% of the people speak Hindi as their first or second language. So that means that half the population can communicate with each other. And the other half, good luck. With the complications of the language, with the complications of geography, it's not surprising that the history of India is very long and very complicated. First of all, there was civilization in India at the same time that the pyramids were being built. And the, this group of people, the civilized group of people who are amazing, um, had contact with Egypt, they had contact with Mesopotamia. Um, <clears throat> more than um, 4,000 years ago, these people had cities with a sewer system. They had houses with bathrooms um, that the waste was flushed away. Um, and it looks like they had some sort of primitive shower system more than 4,000 years ago. So pretty amazing civilization long ago. But the pattern seems to be that some group comes in and unifies the region and they improve the lives of the people. They establish fair laws, fair taxes. They spend time and money on the infrastructure um, and life gets better for everyone. Everyone's really happy, but eventually the rulers start getting lazy. They start looking out for themselves first. They're not looking out for the people dissatisfaction begins to grow and areas begin to break away. I call this the, the sort of cookie and milk phenomena. Um, I'm sure every single one of you has dunked a cookie in milk at some point in your life. You may have given it up now, but at some point you did it. And if you think about dunking your chocolate chip cookie or your oatmeal cookie in milk, <clears throat> Oreos don't work quite as well. If you think about it, if you put it in and pull it out, the first time it comes out whole, but eventually it begins to crumble around the edges. You can still have a solid middle, but the edges have begun to crumble and that begins to happen in India. And eventually you have disunity. It breaks up into smaller states, smaller rulers, um, individual languages, customs, whatever. And then somebody comes in and unites them by force. But to, you can unite people by force, but you can't keep control by force forever. Um, you can't, you've got to have something that unites people. Otherwise, there will be constant rebellion. Now, I think the history of this country is fascinating. And I, in fact, did a course uh, last winter through the OLLI program on just the history of, of South Asia. But we're not going to go back through 5,000 years. We're only going to go back about 500 years. And we're going to go back to about the time that the Tudors, Henry VIII and his six wives and Queen Elizabeth, about the time that they're ruling in England, we're going to go back to that time in, in um, India. And there is a, a guy by the name of Babur, you can sort of, I think of him as Babar, the, the elephant, but Babur. Babur is um, from this region and he begins, he's a warlord and he begins to expand his control. And he is the first Mughal. Um, he creates this little tiny empire, which is mostly in Afghanistan, somewhat into what is now Pakistan and a little bit of Northern India. Um, 
by the way, we have the, the Himalayas here. We have the Hindu Kush. And Hindu Kush literally means mountains of death. Um, so, you know, he had to come across the Hindu Kush. <clears throat> I'm, I'm not seeing anything. The slides aren't turning. The cover. I'm just seeing the blue thing that says Trinity Time Travels. That's okay. all I've seen. Okay, let's go back. Let's do share screen again. It didn't, we were seeing your screen, but the slideshow hadn't started for yeah, us. No, there we go. There you go. Okay, so here's, let me, let me go back just for you to see. Um, yeah. Anyway, we're, let me, I wanna stop this. I'm gonna, uh, Stop share. Let me go back. Let me try to do this right. Um, can you see that? No. I really apologize for this. Um, oh, it, it happens. When I did circle, I know these things happen. Um, let me do escape. Um, okay, so we go, now we go to share screen. Now we go there. And there we do, try that. It's there. There. And now I have blank. Yeah, it says end of slideshow. It went to the end. Okay. From current slides. Can you see that? Yes, Taj Mahal. Okay, there we are. And I got blank again. Yep, it cut back off. And I don't know if that's... Uh, from the beginning. Okay, that. Mm -hmm. That looks right. There we go. Okay. Here we go. Some beautiful pictures. Here's comparison of the size. Here's some of the geography. And again, as I said, this is... Um, the Hindu Kush, the mountains of death. Um, you can see we've got some really low land here. Um, this region over here is where it's, every time there's a monsoon, there's a flooding. Here's a map of some of the languages. I mean, it's just incredibly complicated. And here's this pattern of history that I talked about. So here is, where Babur started, this area up here in, in uh, Kabul. And um, he start, he, why does he come into India? He comes into India because India was where the money was. It's where the wealth was. Afghanistan was, I mean, it was, there's nothing here. It was desolate. Um, and India had always had a lot of wealth and a lot of things um, that dyes, jewels, um, um, most of our cotton, cotton developed here first. Um, most of, the, many of the names we have for kinds of cotton like denim and calico um, are all kinds of, of fabric that came, developed in India first. Uh, so he comes for the wealth. But what's important is his son and he's Akbar. And um, Akbar, comes to power um, about the time that Elizabeth, the son of Henry VIII, the daughter of Henry VIII, comes to power. Um, his goal is to expand the country and unite the country. Now, Akbar, Babur, all of the Mughals are Muslim. 
but the majority of people who live here in um, India are Hindu. And there's also a sma there's um, some Christians, there's a few, a couple of Jewish communities, there's some Buddhism. Uh, so religion is going to become an issue. And Akbar is the one who become who unifies the Mughal Empire. He um, rules from 1556, we'll go back again, uh, to 1605. Queen Elizabeth I ruled from 1558, two years, uh, three years, two years later, and died in 1603. He died in 1605. One of the differences was he was 14 when he inherited the throne. He expands the empire to what were natural boundaries. He adopted programs that won the loyalty of non-Muslim populations. He protected Hindu temples. He married Hindu wives. He united the country by marriage. He had more than 3,000 wives. Now, according to Quran, he's only supposed to have four, but hey, he's the emperor. He can do what he wants to. Um, he reforms and strengthens the administration by improving the, the tax system, um, by having fair laws. He also starts a policy that when a noble, when a landholder died, the son or sons did not automatically inherit the property. All of the property came back to the emperor and then he could give it out again. So it was a way of keeping control. He built roads to unite the empire. It also means he can send his, his uh, armies anywhere he wants to, much like our interstate highway system. I mean, our interstate highway system unites us all, but it was originally designed to move troops around the country. Um, and along the roads, he planted shade trees and he built rest houses. Those rest houses would be the equivalent of a Holiday Inn McDonald's combination. He reforms the currency. He sets up a common system of weights and measures. So a foot was a foot was a foot. Um, and although he never renounced Islam, he took an active interest in other religions. He met with Hindus and Farsis and Christians and, as well as Muslims and encouraged religious destructions and discussions. He was illiterate, um, but he encouraged scholars and poets and painters and musicians. His court was a center of culture. Um, he had a library of 25,000 manuscripts. He is illiterate but he still collects books because he knows they're important. And he, he, he tries to get all of these religious leaders together to find out what is common among all religions. He really believed that there was something that united all religions and that we could create, that he could have a religion which united everybody, one religion for all people. He's a builder. He builds himself a fort. I mean, he's not crazy. Uh, he knows that people could attack him. He builds the red fort at Agra. And um, this is a very typical sort of uh, red sandstone fort. Inside, we see buildings, some started by Akbar, some coming later, which kind of show a fusion between the Hindu style of architecture and the Muslim style of architecture which creates something which is really unique. Um, these, these pavilions, um, here's many of the uh, functions of government took place outside in this pavilion type of area. And as you can see, it's really beautiful. Again, typical architecture that was beginning to develop under Akbar. Also a lot of work on gardens. So Akbar rules from 1556 to 1605, or 16, uh, 1605, and when he dies, he leaves a country which is united, pretty strong, but the problem is his sons. Well, you've got 3,000 wives, you may have a few sons, and there's no real clear policy of who's going to inherit. The son who does inherit is a drunk and ultimately becomes an opium addict. 
And um, that's going to present problems. And his name is Jahangar. And he is going to be the father of Shah Jahan. And Shah Jahan is the man who builds the Taj Mahal. Jahangar rules from 1605 to 1628. And there's the picture that you see in the lower right is Jahangar admiring a picture of his father, um, uh, Akbar. Um, by the way, we have uh, letters that were written between Queen Elizabeth and Akbar. They were in communication by, by messenger uh, during this period of time. Now, um, Jahangar literally means Caesar of the world. Um, and he bans alcohol from his court, except for himself. He said he had to drink for his digestion. And he's an incredibly complicated man. He encourages scientific research um, into plants, into animals. He, liked, he encourages science of all kinds. And yet torture was very common. It's how he dealt with situations. He turned executions into a spectacle. Um, and he welcomes visitors from Europe they came for dyes, for cotton, for pearls, for gems. And he was particularly interested in something that he learned from the Jesuits. The Jesuits were some of the first people. They wanted to go everywhere because they wanted to convert people. And um, I'm wondering, and if you look at, I'm going to go back through these pictures and come back. You can see this picture here. You've got the, you know, we've got the uh, guy from Europe in the lower right hand, lower left hand corner. Um, I'm going to go back and just go through these pictures quickly and see if you can guess what he picked up from the Jesuits. He didn't pick up religion. Anybody notice anything about these pictures, which might seem a little odd? He's got the halo. Is that he's it? got the halo. Yep. He, 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 he likes that idea. And he, he's using... I don't know if you, I always call this the, the plate or the saucer school of Halo. Um, basically in the early, early Renaissance, the Middle Ages and the Renaissance, you have the holy person and you have kind of a, a saucer placed on the side of their head, on the back of the head. Later in the Renaissance, they're able to figure out how to actually float it up there. But he loves that. And we begin to see this halo coming in. And notice we've got angels down there. Um, uh, polishing up his, his hourglass that he's sitting on. Lots of symbolism in this picture, but Jahangar. And Jahangar has um, at least 30 wives. He has seven sons, 12, 14 daughters. Um, and the, daughter, the son that was born in 1592 is Shah Jahan. And he seems to have been the favorite. But succession is really unclear. And, you know, this is a dad who kind of goes, you know, do this or I'll, you know, and I'll make you the ruler after me or do this and you won't get the throne. But Shah Jahan, um, we think was the favorite. And one of the things, um, one of the clues is that Jahangar, who is the guy in the center in the white standing, order the weighing of Shah Jahan on his birthday. The tradition was that on the emperor's birthday, the emperor sat on one side of the scale and people, the nobles throughout the country came and put gold and silver and jewels on the other side to balance him out. Um, and so to have the weighing, which means that you have to, people have to give gold and silver and jewels to, so that Shah Jahan goes up in the air. Um, it's kind of indicates that he's a favorite. So Shah Jahan is born in 1592. Um, he's going to become the ruler when he's 36, when his father dies. But in 1607, he's 14 years old, almost 15. He was at a celebration in the palace where there were, um, well, kind of think about it as, as Diana's crafts fair, uh, except that all the people running booths were kind of nobles. And at, you know, 14, 15 year old boy, he sees this beautiful young Persian Iranian woman and she's selling beads. And he starts to flirt and she flirts back and he says, 
how much are they? And she says, well, they're priceless because they're diamonds. Well, they weren't, but you know, um, and ultimately he goes to his father and says, I want to marry this girl. She's also about the same age and they become engaged. But due to complications in her family circumstance, they were not married until 16, 12 or seven years after they met. So they're 21, 22 when they get married. She is the third of his seven wives. He ultimately is, um, he had already married to two wives before he can marry her. And he gives her the name of Mumtaj Mahal or chosen one of the palace. In less than a year, she gives birth to her daughter. Um, and that daughter is the first of 14 children. Now, when they were married, after they were married, Shah Jahan is sent by his father to put down rebellions. Now, Akbar had done everything possible, Shah Jahan's grandfather, to kind of unite people. Jahangar is drinking. He's not doing a whole lot. And so people on the edges, the cookie is beginning to crumble. And uh, Shah Jahan says, is sent down to put down these rebellions. And he takes Mumtaz with him. 12 of their 14 children were conceived and born while he was on military campaigns. She never left his side. If he went to war, she went to war. If he was someplace, she was someplace. Because for the first years of their marriage, he was this warrior prince. Um, he goes northwest into Afghanistan, but uh, south into what's called the Deccan. Um, as a conqueror, as a military leader, Shah Jahan was a very odd mixture. He had a scorched earth policy. If you were, he reminds me a little bit of the ancient Assyrians. Um, if you fought him, he would destroy everything, uh, including food that his own army could use. But if you surrendered, you got to keep your land um, and all you had to do was send one of your sons to court, back to Jahangir, um, and as a hostage. Um, and um, then you can keep your land and everything was fine. But if you try to rebel again, you're never gonna see that son. Between 1612 and 1616, they had three children. Two of them were girls. And finally, in 1615, they had a boy. Yay, everybody's happy. Uh, but in 1616, their first daughter died of smallpox. Mumtaj, by the way, was just days away from expecting her fourth child. Everybody was devastated with the, the death of this little girl, this first child. But when Mumtaz gives birth to a son, everybody's rejoicing because now there's two sons. And uh, as soon as she recovers from this um, pregnancy and birth, Shah Jahan and Mumtaz and their children head back to the Deccan, which is that area between the pink and the, and the purple, um, for more conquest. They leave with 600 elephants and 10,000 men on horseback. It's just part of their cavalcade. These are huge, massive movements of people. We know a lot about them from a, a guy by the name of Sir Thomas Rowe. And so Thomas Rowe was an English ambassador and he was, went to India to the Mughals because he wanted to have trade concessions. He wanted to control the trade. And he described Jahangir uh, wearing a sword that was covered with diamonds and rubies. He had a ruby as big as a walnut hanging from one side of the turban and a diamond the same size hanging from the other side. He said that Jahangir wore a tunic of cloth of gold and had a chain of pearls and rubies and diamonds around his waist. Roe did not like Shah Jahan. He really said nasty things about him. He thought the, the prince was kind of tyrannical. But in Shah Jahan's defense, he didn't like the fact that Roe was trying to get special concessions and he didn't like how the English behaved, that the English were always fighting and drinking and 
Um, that may have been good for Jahangir, but Muslims are not supposed to use alcohol and Shah Jahan did not use alcohol. And so he didn't like the behavior of the English. Roe did admit that some aspects of the Indian, he, he liked many aspects of the Indian court. He was impressed with the wealth, but he was a little taken back by the arrival of a camel that carried the head of 300 rebels, which was meant as a gift. Um, but so the, uh, they didn't fool around at that point. The campaign of 1616 resulted in a great victory in 1617. Jahangir was thrilled with his son's victory and he gave a huge feast, it was very expensive. This is a picture that was um, um, painting that was done representing this fe feast. We have Shah Jahan kneeling at his father's side. You can tell it's the Shah Jah you can tell it's Jahangir because he's got his halo on. Um, and uh, it makes, he makes very, Jahangir makes very clear at this feast that Shah Jahan was his favorite son and the children of Shah Jahan and Mumtaz were his favorites. And that year, Mumtaz gives birth to her sixth child, her third son. Okay, so 1618, they had been married for uh, six years. She gives birth to her sixth child. Um, Jahangir gives her trays of jewels and 50 elephants and gets the right to name the child and the child's name is Aurangzeb. And three months later, Muntaj is pregnant again. So 1618, favorite son, probable heir, everything's hunky-dory, but things begin to change because of a woman. Um, by 1620, Jahangir is becoming more and more dependent on opium as well as alcohol. He has married a widow uh, and she has become his favorite and she has been seizing power and she likes it. Her name is Noor, N-U-R. And Noor wants power for her own children and she wants power. If Jahangir is being, um, is, is, blotto on opium or drunk on alcohol, then she's the one who's making the decisions. And you can see here, he's, he's decided he's going to have a green halo um, to match his outfit. I, I kind of think it's nice to, you know, have your halo match your outfit. Um, so um, she fears, Noor fears that if Shah Jahan becomes ruler, she's going to lose everything because frankly, he doesn't like her. So she begins to plot and she encourages Jahangir to send Shah Jahan off on a military campaign, which looks like it's gonna be a disaster, but it's a thousand miles away. Uh, so get him out of court, get him out of town. So in the 1620s, there's boring facts, Nora's is taking more and more control of the government from Jahangir, she's doing more of the ruling. By 1623, Shah Jahan really can't take this. Um, and um, he begins to rebel because he, um, he's fighting not his father, but his stepmother. Um, they were, and she, Noor, then sends forces after them. And for three years, Shah Jahan, Muntaz, the children, the supporters are fleeing all over the country. Um, finally, in 1626, there's a truce but they have to ha leave two sons uh, as hostages. And in 16, um, in this period of time between the truce and Jahangir's death, Noor is doing all that she can to undermine this truce and to get power. She in fact marries her daughter from her first marriage to J Jahangir's youngest son, Shah Jahan's brother. Um, there are some mysterious deaths of some other possible family members. When Jahangir dies, Shah Jahan and Mumtaz are hundreds of miles from the court, and Noor says, I'm ruling. But the nobles couldn't, couldn't take her, and they protected Shah Jahan's son, prevented her from seizing the throne, um, and um, Shah Jahan is able to get back to the capital, which is uh, Agra, 
um, and um, uh, become the ruler. When he becomes the ruler in 1628, they have had 11 children. Eight of them are still living. They've lost three. Um, he comes to power, but a half-brother, two nephews, and two cousins all die. Um, he writes a letter which says it would, it, was, it would be better if they were not in this world. Now, if you want to be kind to him, you can say that he was just making a statement, not giving orders, but most people think that this is Shah Jahan saying, get rid of him. Um, and um, so they, he comes to power, his half-brother, two nephews, two cousins, all possible threats to the throne die mysteriously. Um, he had a daughter who died, uh, and then Mumtaj gives birth to a tw 12th child, her eighth son, but then seventh son died. I mean, we've got all sorts of death in that year at the same time. They make their home in the capital in Agra, that's the Red Fort again, um, and um, they settle in. They've been basically they've been on their move, the move their whole married life. Um, she begins to work to improve the gardens. So they're settled down. Um, he begins to rule. He meets with representatives from all over the empire and perhaps all over, over the world. And one of the things that he does is he gives Shah Jahan gives Mumtaj the imperial seal. That means that all official documents had to have this seal on it to be valid, and she's the one who could do it. So she had to approve all of the decisions that were made by the court. So this makes her kind of a co-ruler, um, very important. Um, so he, he's, you know, he's doing this ruler thing. I, I love the guy in the first row, the third person in, the guy in the sort of European um, um, uniform. I don't know if it's supposed to be someone from Europe. He doesn't have European features, but it could, you know, you definitely can tell from the, the dress and the faces of these people that they represent the world who all have come to the court. And we have Shah Jahan sitting on what's known as the peacock throne. Less than a year after he comes to power, there's a rebellion in that southern region, that area of the Deccan. Um, you know, that's the edge of the cookie. That's where the cookie is going to crumble. And so he leads an army south to put an end to this rebellion. At the head of the procession out of Agra begins with the artillery, cannons. Some had barrels 17 feet long. The baggage train has elephants, camels, mules, ox-drawn carts, laborers with spades and pickaxes to clear obstacles. Then you had the uh, infantry. Then there were the guys on horseback, the cavalry. Then you had the elephants carrying the royal court, and they were surrounded by musicians who played trumpets and drums. And then you have the lancers. Those are the guys carrying those lances there. Some were on horseback, some were walking. And then, of course, you have the servants and the camp followers and everything else. This is a, uh, a caravan that the, the end of the caravan would end a day where the beginning of the caravan started. Um, in the royal party, we, had Shah, we have Shah Jahan, his, his sons, his bodyguards, Mumtaj, and as they're leaving, she is three months pregnant with child 13. And this child was uh, born um, while they were traveling, but died shortly after their birth. Now, I have to say, there weren't that many hardships while they were traveling. They had a series of elaborate tents, which include bathhouses, kitchens. Every night, a giant pole was... Um, is set up in the center of camp. It was more than 120 feet high and it was held in place by 16 ropes. At the top of the pole was a cauldron 
that was filled with cottonseed and cottonseed oil, and it was lit at sunset. And the flames would burn all night. So this is like a giant spotlight over the camp. Uh, camp. And there also were torches lit along all the paths. They actually have two sets of tents. One where the emperor was spending the night or nights, and the other was sent ahead, ready to be pitched and ready for him to come and stay. So, um, you know, you, the people who are with the tents, you're not moving real fast with the elephants and all of these people. So that the people who are the, the um, movers of the tents move fairly quickly to a new location set up um, and they go from place to place. The big problem was that the countryside that they're going through, and one of the reasons for the rebellion, is that there had been three years of a serious drought and there was famine. There just was no food. And um, so this was a, a, you know, it was terrible for the people who were living there, the inhabitants, um, but they're really moving into kind of a wasteland. And Mumtaj conceives the child number 14. When it's clear that she's having difficulty with the pregnancy, they move to a fortress palace in the south. And in June of 1631, she goes into labor. At her side was her oldest daughter, surviving daughter, who was 17. Her husband was in the next room. The astrologer said, there's going to be a prince. There's going to be a prince. She was in labor for 30 hours and gives birth to a girl. Shah Jahan rushes to her side, but within hours of the child's birth, Mumtaj is dead, so is the baby. There are several versions of her final conversation with her husband and about her death. Supposedly, she begged him to care for their children and to build her a mausoleum worthy of their love. She actually was buried fairly quickly. Um, in a temporary tomb. That's, the, that's her temporary tomb. Um, her head was pointed north, face, head was to the north, and her face was turned towards Mecca. Shah Jahan goes into two years of serious mourning. He wears only white, which was the custom of the Hindus um, in India. No jewels, no costly, um, clothing. Um, he openly cried. Hang on. Um, no music was allowed, no dancing. And he stopped pulling out his gray hair. When he starts appearing in public again, his hair has turned white. He is in his early 40s at this time. Um, and um, he was devastated by her death. Now, he's got set six other wives, but Mumtaj had, was the one that he loved. When she died, she was incredibly wealthy. She had gold, silver, gems. She probably was worth $33 million at her death. And she gave half of it to her elder daughter, her eldest daughter, the one who was by her side. Um, and uh, the rest was divided among the other children. This elder daughter, who gets half of her mother's wealth, also becomes the Begum Saeed. She gets the imperial seal. So she's, a bit, she's 17 years old. And she begins to help her father take the place of her mother. Now, one of the things that had happened much earlier, long before she was born, as a law had been passed that the daughters of the emperor could not marry. Um, and so she's, the, the feeling was that people would marry the daughters of the emperor to get power and maybe try to take the throne. She is very well educated. Um, and um, she oversees, she speaks Persian, uh, reads, and writes and speaks both Persian and Arabic. She oversees the education of her younger brothers and sisters. Um, she was a great support for her, her father. Uh, when she 
she almost died at one point. Um, the clothing, very light cottons, very gauze-like. Um, she was wearing a sari that touched an open flame that was being used for um, lighting. And uh, she was very badly burned. They didn't know if she was gonna survive. When she did recover, um, her father gave her 130 pearls, a tiara covered with diamonds, and the revenues from the major port um, in the country, all the tax money came to her. So um, she was um, a very wealthy young lady in her own right. But back to Shah Jahan, in 1630, he, he between Mumtaj's death and his death in 1658, he does the two years of mourning and then he becomes obsessed with building the tomb. Most of this tomb was completed within 10 years, but construction of some sort, tweaking it went on for 20, probably a billion dollars. He becomes, um, he builds other buildings. Um, he becomes a repressive with other religions. He orders the destruction of Hindu temples to build a mosque. Um, and of course, when most of your subjects are Hindu, that's not a good thing to do. He begins the persecution of Christians. Um, and you wonder whether or not Mumtaj had been some sort of, um, you know, restraining force on him. He is incredibly wealthy, but he spends more and more on personal luxury. He's not improving the roads or maintaining the roads or the bridges. He's not dealing with the infrastructure of the country. He sends his sons off on military campaigns. They were doomed to lose. There was no way they were going to win them. Uh, bribery takes the place of strategy. Okay, we have seven surviving children. The two other daughters, other Jahanara's two sisters, are jealous of Jahanara's privileges. The four sons are jockeying for power and frustrated when they're sent out on doomed missions because their father doesn't send them enough supplies and men to do what they're supposed to do. And finally, in 1658, Jahanara, um, who's trying to be the good daughter, um, is not able to stop her, four, her brothers from rebelling. The the four sons rebel. They lay siege to the fort at Agra, where Shah Jahan was. And the most militaristic of the, of the sons, Aurangzeb, the one named by his grandfather, seizes the throne. And then he kills his brother. So that's the way you get rid of anyone who might challenge you. Shah Jahan is imprisoned in the Red Fort. And uh, supposedly in rooms that where he could look out and see the Taj Mahal, and he stays imprisoned in those rooms until his death eight years later. Some accounts say that Shah Jahan was treated really well. Others say that he was emotionally tortured. He was never physically tortured, but emotionally tortured, um, that people would bang on the walls and play music to late in the nights. It always sort of reminded me of, um, I think it was with Noriega in Panama when he was holed up in the house. Um, they were playing, um, you know, heavy metal uh, outside to make his life miserable. Um, and supposedly Shah Jahan, who was Jahanara was with him until his death. Um, supposedly he died out on the balcony looking out over the, okay, here he is with Jahanara. Um, those are the rooms um, where he was. And you can see in the distance, we have the Taj Mahal. Now the Taj Mahal is more than just a building. It is a whole complex of buildings, gardens, and the Taj John um, is, uh, was designed as a marketplace. Um, so you have a gateway, you've got servants' quarters, you've got gardens, you've got a mosque, you've got a guest house, and then you have a, a building which is designed as a tomb. So boring facts, most of the Taj was finished, most of this complex was finished in 10 years, but they worked on it for 17. 
The structure is, inner structure is brick. It's clad in marble, inlaid with precious and semi-precious stones. We have no idea who designed it. Some people say that it came to Shah Jahan in a dream. Others say it was an Italian architect. We have no clue. The building we think of as the Taj is about, is 561 feet high, 56 stories. The dome is 130 feet um, high. And the walls of the dome are more than 12 feet thick. Probably somewhere in your house, you have a room which is 12 by something. Think about that as the, um, the, the thickness of the walls of the dome. There were 22,000 workers who worked on this. It caused an artificial famine in the empire. He demanded food be brought in for these workers, even if it caused famine in other parts of the, of the empire. There was plenty of food, and there was, you know, there was an excess of food around where the Taj was being built, where other places are, um, are starving. The cost in today's currency, $1.5 billion, just for the building. That's not counting the gardens or the other structures. So this is an aerial view. Um, you can see the, the um, here's the, the mausoleum. Uh, here's the guest house, the mosque, the gardens, uh, the gatehouse. This is where the, uh, this is all built in now, but this is where he planned for a marketplace. Here's another view, mausoleum, the gatehouse, the gardens. So if you come to the gatehouse, the gatehouse is um, red sandstone. Um, it's, it's a brick structure, like we would use steel, they used brick and they had to make all of the bricks, of course, and then covered with the sandstone. Um, this is um, marble, which is inlaid with precious and semi-precious stones. You can get an idea of the size of this gatehouse with the people here. Okay, now technically in Islam, you are not supposed to do representation of people and animals. Um, Islamic uh, art is, is absolutely fascinating because one of the things that becomes very much part of it is this sort of design. This is calligraphy. These are prayers. Uh, these are passages from the Quran um, in um, uh, calligraphy. Um, Flowers, okay, plenty of things that you can do. You can see inside we've got this dome, which is uh, sandstone with mother of pearl inlay. And as you walk through this gatehouse, this is what you would begin to see as you move to the, the mausoleum itself. This building is built as the resting place of Montage. Okay, that's the only purpose for this building. It's not a, re it's not a church, it's not, there's nothing else. It's just her tomb. Okay, again, coming through the gateway, looking down. So this is looking back at the, the uh, gateway. Um, and you can see the, the reflecting pools here um, and all of the people. Here is, as you come closer, um, this may give you an idea of of the um, size of this building, um, it is a, um, it's enormous. Um, another view, got the towers in the corner. <clears throat> so here's the main gateway, very much like the gateway itself, except that this building is made out of marble. We've got the calligraphy. This is, um, it's a couple of kinds of stone or in, sometimes black marble. And this calligraphy, as you go up the, the columns, is um, designed so that it looks like it's the same size. So it makes adjustment for your eye. I mean, normally when you look at, up at something, it gets smaller and smaller and smaller. This looks like all of the characters are the same size. So they've sort of adjusted that for you. It's an optical illusion. Okay, you can see people walking across the marble towards the building. Uh, there are the four towers, uh, the four minarets. Um, and 
you know, even the detail on the minaret, which you can't see um, from a distance, uh, there's inlaid precious stones on these towers. Here's uh, the dome itself, and you can see the decoration around the dome. No one, no one's close enough to see that. Um, only if you've got, today you've got probably drones that can take you up there, uh, special photography. The average visitor can't see that detail. It's still there. You can see the very top. This is the interior of the building with the, the dome. This is um, red, this is sandstone, um, red sandstone with mother of pearl inlay. Um, Arabic um, Islamic art does a lot of designs and patterns and you can see that here. See the intricacy. Imagine the kind of workmanship it took to do all of this. And that's not painted on, that is inlaid. So somebody's had to carve out and put in. So in the center was the cenotaph, um, or you might say kind of the, the, the monument to Mumtaj. And she was exactly the center of the building. Now, when, when Shah Jahan died, they decided, they were nice, they decided to bury him with mom, um, but they, um, there really wasn't space for him. So they sort of shove him over to the side. Now, the rumor always is that he was planning to build a matching building in black marble on the other side of the river. Uh, this is right on the river. And that the, he would duplicate this in black marble for himself. There's mixed feelings about, and that that was what sent his son, uh, Aurangzeb, over the edge. That Aurangzeb said, no, you know, we've already spent billions. Um, we've wasted the country's money. We can't do any more. Um, whether or not that's true, we're really unsure. It's just, the, it's in the world of rumor. It might be true. It might not be true. But what we do know is he certainly wasn't being planned to be buried here with her because he would not have shoved himself over in that corner. So this is that area. Um, Mumtaj is, um, um, and, and Shah Jahan are buried in here, or this is their monument. They're actually buried on the floor below. And you can see there that you've got the uh, inlaid marble. Um, you've got some of, we'll see some more detail. There's their, hers is the smaller cenotaph, his is the larger one. He's got the higher platform and the bigger monument. She's got the lower platform. Both of them are very decorative. This is a grating which goes around. It is a combination of marble and gold gilt. Um, you can see the metal here, which is covered with gold, gold leaf. Here's a, cl a close-up of the inlay. So this is white marble, and this is semi-precious stones. We've got some jade. I think we've got some carnelian. There's probably some amber in there. Um, and um, again, that is all inlaid. It would be cut out and those stones would be placed in. I don't know how they do it. And I don't know how they manage to do so many identical. The floor beneath where you tourists don't go, this is where their actual tombs are and her tomb and his tomb. Again, hers is exactly in the center. His is bigger, but his is shoved off over to the side. We have the um, uh, Arabic uh, calligraphy, again, prayers and passages from the Quran, um, the inlaid flower design. In some places, it's just carved marble. There are places where things are missing because when the British took India in um, the 1870s, um, um, this was a place where the British uh, liked to come and um, have picnics. And many people pulled out their pen knives and used their pen knife to pop the stones because some of the stones were, there were rubies, there were diamonds, there were pearls, there were, you know, lapis lazuli, jade. This is a nice souvenir. So people began to do that. And you can see that the, the delicacy of the, of the work that they did. So there are 
28 different kinds of precious or semi-precious stones, um, rubies, uh, turquoise, malachite, jade, lapis lazuli, and they came from all over. He brought, they, they weren't all native to India. Um, so it's an incredible building, but it did bankrupt the country. But you can see the kind of craftsmanship, that, that's marble, um, which has been carved in that design. You know, what happens when you broke something? I, I don't know. Um, I guess you didn't break anything. Um, again, some detail of the, the different kinds of stones. This is all inlaid. So if you would lay your, run your hand over this, the surface of it would be smooth. You wouldn't feel anything coming out. Def I can identify mother of pearl. I can identify jade, lapis lazuli, carnelian. Um, so at the beginning of um, 2020, they were working on a long-term project to clean the building because that river that it's on is very polluted. And the marble, the white marble was turning yellow and green. In the middle of March, um, it shut down. Surprise, surprise. Um, and it opened Monday of this week. Um, and um, so it's been open. Today is day three of, op of having been opened. Um, we, they will only allow 5,000 people in a day. Normally it's 20,000. And you're limited to a three hour visit. Now, I, I'm not sure how you limit somebody to three hours. I mean, somebody buys a ticket and at 10 o'clock and they're supposed to be out at one. Um, you know, how do you, do you go and round them up? I, I don't know how do you do that or whether or not, you know, one group can come in from nine o'clock to noon and they empty everything out. And then another group comes in from one o'clock to, to four. I, I don't know how they're gonna do it. Um, Tourism is the lifeblood of this area, and this area had been very uh, badly hit by COVID. India has now, has now the second highest rate of COVID cases in the world, um, second only to the United States, okay? Uh, and remember, their population is four times our population. Um, so interesting to kind of look at all of that. Um, whether or not this stays open, whether it closes, we really don't know. But we are left with a question, and this building really represents a love story. I mean, he loved her. Um, there's no way around that. But um, he didn't love his country because he, he really set his country on the path of destruction by taking all of this money his son who follows after him um, is stuck with, this is, this is when the Europeans are coming in full force and full power and um, the Mughal empire has very little to defend itself with. Um, and the Europeans begin to take advantage and within 200 years, well, within 100 years, England and France are fighting over who's going to take India and within 200 years, India has become a, um, a colony of uh, Great Britain. So it's a love story. It's a beautiful building. And it's certainly, um, I, I have to be honest, even though I've had friends and who, I have one friend who, who's lived in India for a while. I've had a number of friends who have visited India. It's not a country that I've wanted to sort of visit. There's a lot of things that I kind of go, I don't, I don't want to deal with that. Um, I'd love to see this building. If somebody could helicopter me in and set me down and, you know, I can see the building and, and leave again. But it does leave you with the question of, yes, this is a beautiful legacy for us to see, but we're really seeing, we're seeing a love story, but we're seeing the, the beginning of the end of, um, a very powerful and interesting empire. So. <clears throat>